left to right, meaning nothing to do with their political inclinations at all. Uh, and starting, uh, if you wish, please, with Donald Blaney. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for, for coming. This is a discussion about um, whether we need a written constitution. Uh, and I wonder whether actually that's the right question, whether it's about having uh, a modern, up-to-date Bill of Rights rather than the Constitution as such. Um, ultimately, I suppose, if we want a, a modern written Bill of Rights, the appropriate thing to do would be to adopt the American um, Bill of Rights wholesale, because uh, I have to say I consider it to be incredibly sublime and evidently most robust. And if you, of course, examine what it includes among the various... Um, rights. I've downloaded a Bill of Rights app to uh, remind myself of the various rights, but you know, having something like a fundamental right to freedom of expression, which we're told is inherent in English law, would be a nice start. Um, Second Amendment rights, okay, I'm particularly robust on Second Amendment rights. I don't think that I'd ever succeed in pushing those through here in uh, England or Wales. Is it a common Bill of Rights? Uh, it was in, our, in the 1689 Bill of Rights, but it's, it said right to bear arms as prescribed by law, which unfortunately is the Weasley part that Parliament, the Parliament resigned on. It's nice being heckled first thing, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> also, it's limited to Protestants. <laughs> it was limited to Protestants as well. Um, being heckled in such an informed way is... <laughs> uh, <laughs> only, only at a freedom of association. <laughs> um, we, of course, already have a constitution, and... and you know, it, it works, it's flexible, and it's terribly, um, it's terribly British, because what we've managed to do is avoid a whole series of constitutional squabbles and revolutions uh, for certainly the last 300 plus years that we might otherwise have had to endure. And I can't help but think that if we try and unravel something that's been so stable and has worked so effectively as it has, then we're going to be uh, creating a whole series of problems. Um, exhibit A, the referendum in Scotland, and uh, the devolution that's occurred over the last um, 15, 20 odd years or so. Now, look, I understand the attraction as much uh, as the next person. Obviously, the big thing that's been driving all of us on this is the issue of prisoners' votes, which was so ably campaigned for by a prisoner called John Hurst. Uh, Alex and I have endured the... Uh, Charms. The charms of Mr. Hurst, who uh, put on Twitter, um, let's kill all the lawyers, starting with Dean and Blaney. <laughs> <laughs> Which normally I, normally I wouldn't have been remotely phased by, but for the fact that Mr. Hurst order. is a convicted axe murderer. In that, in that order. <laughs> it was in that order, starting with Alex. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but, the, but the chap's convicted axe murderer, so that it really isn't too healthy a thing. Um, we have also have to recognise that it's things like the right to a family life that have been so heavily abused by those with whom we disagree and people various invoking certain rights laws to get a free boob job on the NHS. And the concept of bringing our rights home does sound very appealing um, to us as small-c conservatives. My concern is that if we start a constitutional convention to have our own um, modern version of a Bill of Rights, if we try and readopt, whether it's the European Courts, um, the, the European Convention on Human Rights, or some other relatively modern form of rights, and try and apply our, our own jurisprudence to it here in England and Wales, European Court jurisprudence will encroach, as has happened in the United States. And I think that a constitutional convention today will fail. It will not be conservative an outcome. Um, we will end up being lumbered with a whole series of faux rights uh, similar to those that the Europeans have uh, tried to suggest as part of the Lisbon Treaty. And any convention, you can guarantee, will be staffed brilliantly by the left with people who have rights culture in their very being. And we will manage to screw it up and put people on there who are placemen at the behest of Number 10 or CCHQ. So my message is that this is a trap. It's a tempting one that's sold to us by those who don't want the better option adopted, which would be to leave the European Union. That ultimately is the real solution to the problems that are leading to this debate. We would finally be a self-governing nation, we'd have a supreme parliament that wouldn't bind its successors, and our basic rights would be able to be enforced by judicial review on limited grounds, rather than um, the leftward judicial activism that invokes rights legislation as now. And my final point is, I think that we on the right are woefully underprepared for any battle um, for a constitutional convention on a, on a current Bill of Rights. 
I fear that this was the back of a fag packet pledge that's been made by CCHQ. And we as a movement are so unprepared. We don't have the strength and depth in the legal profession that we should have. Um, I'm a member of the Society of Conservative Lawyers, but I think that in terms of its effectiveness, it's not up there, let's say, with the Freedom Association or the Taxpayers' Alliance in terms of its um, activities. I think there is no concentration on the right in using judicial activism or litigation for our own political ends. The left do this fantastically. We don't, and we should. There's no prioritising on getting our people appointed, whether to the bench uh, or running organisations that can push the agenda. The number of times you look at charities or quangos, they're staffed full of either ex-Labour MPs, Labour councillors, Labour placemen. Where the hell are our people in these positions advancing the agenda from our perspective? We can sit here being ideologically pure and say these organisations shouldn't exist, and of course that's my ultimate position. But while they're there, we need our people in place um, stopping the left from pushing their agenda forward. So, this battle may well still come. Um, the genie is out of the bottle, I think, because the concept has been mooted. The other side are ready. Let's not fool ourselves. They're well-funded, they're well-organised, they've got people in position, the media is with them. They will push and push and push the rights agenda from their perspective further and further forward. Um, and we know what their ultimate game is. It is a republic. It is an end to our constitutional monarchy. And we need to spend the next five or more years preparing for this battle, because if we fight it now, we will lose. And we will end up with a disastrous Bill of Rights that will have a whole series of things called rights that are nothing of the kind. And we need to have organisations set up here that are similar to something like the Institute of Justice in the States, which pushes forward... And public interest litigation from our side, or mimic what the Federalist Society does in the United States, which is to create a proper network of conservative common lawyers, um, including students, who will defend and advance our agenda. Without that, we are going to lose this battle. It is not a battle we should be fighting at this stage, um, and we should only get into fights when we stand a chance of winning them. We will lose if we do it now. Thank you very much. General, thank you very much indeed. Martin Hare. Right, well, uh, I, I think uh, it won't come as a surprise. Uh, by the way, everyone, thank you for being here. Thank you for resisting the charms of Boris <laughs> in order to participate in this very important and interesting subject. Uh, it won't surprise you to know that I feel, meant, uh, I feel in, in a way, much the same as Donal on uh, this subject. Um, and I, I think what we start with is asking you know, what do we have in the way of a constitution? Now, it's actually not accurate to say that we don't have a constitution in this country. We do. And it's not accurate to say it isn't written. Um, because what it consists of, uh, mainly, uh, with a few, there are some common law rules which underpin it, which are the creation of the judiciary over the centuries. But our constitution, in fact, consists of a series of acts of parliament <coughs> Uh, each of which is important in its own right. Uh, there is the Parliament Act, which regulates the relationship between the House of Commons and the Lords. Uh, there is the Representation of the People Act, uh, which uh, re regulates elections to the House of Commons. Uh, and, and that, of course, uh, is the product of, of, mainly in the 19th century, a huge amount of political controversy and constitutional change, leading gradually from a very unrepresentative system for electing the House of Commons to the system we have today. And also, and I class this as a constitutional statute, we have the Human Rights Act. Um, you may not like it, but I think it's there. It's part of the Constitution at the moment. And we have the European Communities Act of 1972, which again is a constitutional statute. Uh, it regulates how laws are made in this country. Again, I suspect many people in this room don't like it, but there it is. It's part of our Constitution. Now, should we have a formal document, headed constitution, in which we draw together and put these things in? Um, uh, there are two points which come along. One is Donald's point, which I agree with, is that if you do that and have some sort of special constitutional convention, uh, the document that emerges won't necessarily be the document that we in this room would want to see, but all sorts of extra things will be added in some of which we may not like at all. 
And the second point about a written constitution, and I think is a very important one, uh, is that the whole point um, of having a, a document called a constitution in almost all systems is that it has a special status um, it, it, uh, above ordinary laws. And normally it's amended only by some special procedure. Uh, the United States Constitution is very interesting in this regard because it is incredibly difficult to amend. Um, I, I've been corrected on the exact details, but you have to get it through uh, both, both the Senate and, and the House, uh, the amendment, and I think it's two-thirds two -thirds of the state's legislatures have to ratify it. Uh, so, so getting a constitutional amendment through is an extremely difficult process. And in one sense, this... Um, and the purpose of it, in one sense, is it protects uh, the Constitution from meddling uh, and in, entrenches it, and it protects, amongst other things, the constitutional rights and the Bill of Rights. Well, that's fine and dandy as far as it goes, but it produces, I'm afraid, another effect, um, which uh, I know is uh, dear to the parts of the Federalist Society who are kindly sponsoring this event, um, uh, and, and that is... Unfortunately, it doesn't get rid of the politics about what your constitution says. It moves the politics into the courts. Uh, and if you have a text which is un unamendable, the effect of that is that it transfers a huge amount of political power to the judiciary. Um, in this country, under our constitution, all these constitutional acts I've mentioned are amendable by the ordinary process a simple majority in the House of Commons. So uh, if the judges do something that is regarded as going too far or a misinterpretation of what Parliament has said, Parliament can, by an ordinary process, uh, pass a law that amends it and, and corrects the problem. Uh, and once you have a written constitution which is entrenched, you don't have that safeguard. Uh, so uh, you, you end up uh, with enormously controversial political subjects being uh, decided um, by uh, a small group of people, um, on, in their case on the Supreme Court. Uh, and the, the, pro the problem is, you know, every appointment to the Supreme Court then becomes a matter of acute political controversy. Um, and uh, you... you and you find the decision making is removed from the ordinary democratic process in many part many areas. So for, for those reasons, I, I mean, frankly, I'm not in favour um, of moving to any form of system where uh, the um, uh, where, where you get entrenchment. On the other hand, um, I, I'm not a friend of the Human Rights Act. And the problem there uh, is actually uh, we have a system where we've exported the judicial activism. Because we have the <coughs> European Court of Human Rights at Strasbourg as the ultimate arbiter of the interpretation of the convention rights, which we've put into our own law by the Act, uh, we, we've actually moved the judicial activism to that court. And, of course, that cannot be controlled Nothing Parliament can say or do uh, can alter either the Convention itself. You would need uh, 47 member states unanimously to agree to any change, nor judgments of the court. Again, to, to actually override judgments of the court, you'd need to get 47 European states to agree, and that's not going to happen. Um, ergo, um, the, the, the only way that we can overcome judicial activism in that context um, is we can do various things to... Uh, reduce the impact of Strasbourg judgments inside our own legal system, or ultimately, if that doesn't work, uh, we may be faced with, with withdrawing from the Convention. And if we do do that, well, uh, a Bill of Rights of our own uh, is uh, an obvious thing to fill the space. Now, if you're, um, uh, I'll be slightly historical now, if you're a devotee of... Um, A.V. Dicey, the famous 19th century uh, constitutional lawyer and historian, um, you would say uh, this is anathema, only you know, Parliament will protect our rights, we don't need anything in the way of a formal document. Uh, to which I would say, well, things have changed a great deal since the days of A.V. Dicey. 
Uh, most of our uh, laws, actually the majority of our laws, are now made by statutory instruments and subordinate. They're not debated line by line in Parliament. They're um, produced by the bureaucracy and they're subject to very cursory parliamentary examination. Uh, and uh, the other thing is the professionalisation of politics. A.B. Dicey's argument was that Parliament represents the people, and so Parliament is not going to pass laws that oppress itself. The people are not going to pass laws that oppress themselves. When you have a, um, a much more professionalised political class, it doesn't quite work the same way. So I, I, I do favour myself uh, having a Bill of Rights of our own, um, plugged into our own um, constitutional and legal traditions, uh, we don't need uh, the linkage to Europe to make it work. Uh, and indeed, you know, we have Commonwealth countries who are perfectly um, regarded as perfectly satisfactory in the way they protect individual rights. Uh, New Zealand, for example, has a Bill of Rights which has no special status. Parliament can override it. Canada has a Bill of Rights where Parliament can override it. Um, uh, and with that mechanism, that corrective mechanism, uh, rather than having a Bill of Rights that the judges enforce and, you know, against and over the will of Parliament, um, I would support that as part of our Constitution. Martin, thank you very much. Dominic Rahm. Alex, thanks. And can I just also add my um, gratitude to the uh, Freedom Association for organising it again, a great series of events. Um, I, like the others, like Donal and uh, Alex, I've had experience with John Hurst as well. When I wrote a column for the Telegraph uh, criticising prisoner voting. Um, after a long list of, of comments, as you I want to get on the Telegraph website, um, a rather nervous assistant in my office said, uh, John Hurst has commented on your piece. And it read, this time, Mr. Raab, you've gone too far. Which <laughs> struck me as... <laughs> compared to some of the things I've said, it, was, um, it struck me as rather Scooby-Doo. And, but it was lovely the way there was a very genteel Telegraph reader who afterwards said, no, Mr. Hurst, I think it's you that went too far. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, he obviously he, he murdered his landlord with, a, with, an, with an axe handle. So... Um, uh, Anyway, we've all had experiences of Mr. Hurst, um, and that's the beauty of, of democratic debate. I think, uh, like Martin said, um, we already do have a written constitution, it's just not written in one place. Um, we've got things like Magna Carta, Bill of Rights, common law principles, of course, they're written um, in all different aspects of case law, um, parliamentary prerogatives, conventions, and now the Human Rights Act, EU law, and uh, the case law of the European courts. Uh, so the question for me is, is there a strong both democratic but also public consciousness point or public trust point about having it written, having the basic cornerstones written in one place, endorsed by a referendum and, 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 and consider the issue of special protection for certain bedrock principles, although carefully defined? Um, I think the point um, I would be very wary about is that whenever politicians talk about um, producing a piece of legislation or even super legislation like a, with constitutional effect, the simplification can often end up resulting in obfuscation. Um, this is what lawyers and parliamentarians do. Um, I hold my hands up. I, you know, um, it, it, it is what Parliament does. So we need to be aware about that. And Donald made some really important tactical and practical points. Um, I also think, on the other hand, there are some principled reasons why we might want to consider it or should be at least open to it long term. Um, I think the first reason is that a written constitution, Bill of Rights, call it what you may, would better defend our liberties. And I'm really thinking of our core freedoms as citizens. We've got the celebration of Magna Carta. Um, it's a 800th anniversary uh, next year. Um, we've got that rich tradition of that history in our country, but we know our bedrock freedoms have been salami sliced willfully by the last government, but there's also strain and stresses in this coalition. Um, and I think some of the particular safeguards around bedrock principles of British liberty, innocent till proven guilty, habeas corpus, right to jury trial, which is always under attack um, uh, by politicians across the spectrum, free speech. Um, I think that's important. That's not just part of our history. It's part of our fabric of our society. It's part of our way of life. Um, and, and yes, this coalition has done a pretty good job on certain areas. Uh, abolishing ID cards, halving detention without charge, but look at the uh, 
temp political temptation with the Snoopers Charter. I think some of the stuff trailed so exuberantly in the media today about banning groups and individuals who, who engage in non-violent so-called extremism. Be very wary about monarchists um, through to communists like Bob Crow, um, who might well be caught up in that. I mean, I don't agree with them, but we ought to protect that space for debate. And I think the Bill of Rights um, it might be one way of doing that. There's also, you know, putting aside for a moment the question of renegotiation with Europe, we're getting an increasing amount of fairly authoritarian legislation from Brussels. Um, I'm thinking of the European Arrest Warrant. I'm thinking of the Prum Treaty on which impacts on data protection, personal privacy. And countries with written constitutions and constitutional courts have generally been better, not universally successful, but better at withstanding and mitigating those intrusions. Um, so I think there's an argument there as well. But basically, I think there is an argument that fundamental freedoms, a core list, not a big long list, uh, reasonably well defined, actually ought to be protected and possibly even entrenched, although I'm mindful of what Martin said. I think the second reason that I'm at least attracted in principle to the idea of some form of Bill of Rights or written constitution is that it could curb the inflation of human rights beyond that core list of irreduc that irreducible minimum of bedrock rights, and which is the liberal tradition. Um, you know, uh, and you think of the constantly expanding list of human rights, whether it's from the Strasbourg Court on prisoner voting, Abu Qatar, the, 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 the increasing fetters on deportation, um, the whole life tariff case, uh, you know, ending the principle, challenging, attacking the principle that life should mean life for certain um, uh, serial sadistic murderers. Um, you know, that's one of those areas where actually these things were never. Uh, rights conceived in the original convention, but have gradually been through judicial legislation expanded. Expanded. I think a bill of rights could try and curb that, or at least curtail it. Um, we've also had the expansion of human rights through the Human Rights Act, particularly on increasing fetters on deportation through the expansion of the right to family life. Right to family life was dealing originally with things like allowing people to get married and not having uh, people's, uh, you know, not having. Uh, ethnic minority groups banned from having children or, or separated from their family. And you think about the Holocaust and, and Nazi Germany and what that was intended. It was never intended to deal extraterritorially or, or with the question of deportation um, of people who have convicted in prisonable offences. Um, so that's another example. For me, if I'm looking at this from a philosophical uh, point of view, and I always like to have a bit of philosophy when I come to the Freedom Association, mm -hmm. I, I have the model of Isaiah Berlin in my mind. And he was always very strong about uh, protecting um, uh, what he called negative liberty, which was the ability, protecting us from the ability of the state to intrude on our core freedoms. But he was also very careful about saying uh, that, that human rights and, or liberty shouldn't, shouldn't necessarily extend to or, or, or should be distinguished from positive liberty, which is about individuals imposing claims on the state. And I think that's actually, when I think of the British tradition of liberty, I've got Berlin and John Stuart Mill and those sorts of people in mind. Um, and I think if you exponentially expand the list of human rights beyond those core British freedoms, um, you, you, do, you do a few things. You, you, you diminish the, the ethical currency of rights. You know, we ought, to, we ought to protect certain individualist things, but actually we ought to be careful that we don't end up increasing the list of things that trump the public interest to such a great degree that you can't get anything done from deportation to criminal justice. Um, I think it's also had an effect, the, the rights inflation of fueling the compensation culture. We're trying to scale some of that back um, as well. Um, and uh, there's also, as well as the Strasbourg and the HRA, you've got the creeping influence of the European Court of justice as well. And I think the triplication of human rights from the EU is going to be a major issue in the years ahead. So I think a, a written constitution can guarantee that what counts as a human right is decided by elected lawmakers who are ultimately accountable to all of you. And uh, that's, I think, um, uh, the way we, you know, the, something we should at least bear in mind. And the third, the third, I think, strong argument for written constitution or broader bill of rights is the springboard that it might offer us for a wider democratic renewal, whether it's on the separation of powers, and I think, so to, thinking about some of the things that, that Martin was talking about, the problems they've had in the US with the US Constitution, I don't think they've been as bad as we've got here in terms of judicial activism, but, 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 but we could actually make sure that the canons of interpretation for the courts are spelt out in degree more clarity. We could make clear that, that separation of powers between what 
elected lawmakers write as the laws of the land is distinguished from the independent role of judges, which needs to be protected as well, to interpret and enforce and adjudicate the law, but make sure that that doesn't overlap. The big problem I've had with the Human Rights Act in Strasbourg has been this judicial legislation. That's something a Bill of Rights could at least help articulate and clarify. Um, I also actually think that a written constitution could strengthen Parliament as a body that exercises proper scrutiny um, over the executive. Um, and we ought to have more of that. We ought to have a rambunctious Parliament. You know, I was talking to a journalist um, at The Independent on Sunday, and they were saying, oh, all these right-wing Tory you know, rebels. And I said, you know, did make the point that Parliament should be rambunctious and vibrant, and we shouldn't all be clones. Not on our side, not on Labour's side, um, not on the Liberal Democrat side, not on any side. Actually, people want their voters, uh, their MPs that they voted for, to stand up for what they believe in and what they've talked about. And I, I think a lot of people feel like that. Well, strengthening Parliament is a way to do that because a lot of people feel that whatever they say in Parliament doesn't have much effect because government's got such a strong, the executive's got such strong control over the legislature. Um, I also think, finally, in the aftermath of Scottish devolution, um, whether it's localisation, um, stronger local democracy, um, perhaps even House of Lords reform at some point, um, the UK's relationship with the EU. These are things which, at least in principle, a written constitution could protect our democratic prerogatives in relation to. Um, so for me, if we could find a way of overcoming some of those very reasonable objections you've, you've already heard about, we might be able to craft a written constitu con constitution that defends our freedom, that curbs the rights, inf the rights inflation, and strengthens the responsibility and the accountability of MPs like me to you. And who knows if we achieve that over time, we might also rebuild some of that crumbling trust in, in our democracy. Thank you very much. Dominic, thank you very much. Ian Murray. Thank you, Alex, and thanks, Rory, again, for, and Simon, for uh, putting on this wonderful event. And, of course, thanks to my colleagues from the Federalist Society in the United States. Uh, despite my accent, I am actually a resident of the United States. I've lived there for 18 years now, uh, give or take a couple of months, and uh, have therefore lived under a written constitution for 18 years. And in the process of living under that constitution, I've actually learned far more about the English constitution than I ever knew when I lived in England, despite being uh, active in politics when I, when I was here. So what, I think my role on, the, on this panel is to give you a, a, a few warnings from the United States as to what can happen with a written constitution, but also to point out that I think that uh, the United Kingdom is sleepwalking into a written constitution, which could be a, a, a serious problem. The first thing to note is that it was established very, very early on uh, with the US constitutional process that the Constitution has to be more than an instrument of government. And actually, we should always remember that England did actually have a written Constitution in 1653, the instrument of government that Cromwell established. Uh, and the, and uh, the, the founding fathers of the United States actually took uh, quite a bit of interest in what has happened under the English Republic. And their original intention was that the Constitution would be an instrument of government. It would lay out what powers each branch of government had. But government is government, and government does what government does. And it be, the, the argue, in fact, the Founding Fathers very much uh, ascribed to Dicey's belief that uh, representatives in Congress were representatives of the people and so could be guaranteed to protect their rights. It very quickly became apparent that that wasn't the case. And that's why the Bill of Rights was introduced so soon after the, uh, after the ratification of the Constitution. So if you have a Constitution, it can't just be uh, an instrument of government. It has to also include uh, a, a Bill of Rights, is, is a lesson from the American experience. Uh, a, a second lesson is that small changes to the written Constitution can have enormous effects. Uh, as, uh, as Martin very rightly noted, it is very difficult to get an amendment through the, uh, to the Constitution through the US political process. In fact, uh, the, the original Bill of Rights in the United States had 12, uh, uh, 12 items, 12 clauses, uh, of which 10 were ratified immediately. One, uh, uh, first proposed in 1789, was uh, not ratified until the 1970s. 
uh, that to do with compensation of, uh, of, of representatives. And, uh, and a twelfth uh, item is still stuck in the ratification process. But once you do get an amendment through, uh, it can have a, a very, very big effect. For instance, uh, if you take the amendment that deals with the direct election of senators, uh, this seemed to be a, 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 a perfect, this came through in the Edwardian era and seemed to be a perfectly acceptable democratic principle uh, that, uh, that senators should be directly elected by the people rather than appointed by the state. However, this very simple change actually broke the constitutional process. The, uh, the, the, the United States is, in the United States, the state is the fundamental constitutional unit. And when they had direct appointment of, uh, of senators from the states, then there was a direct link from the states into uh, the United States Congress. That was broken with one simple change. So the entire constitution became something very, very different. Similarly, the, uh, the, the 14th Amendment to the constitution, which is in, in many ways a, a mini constitution within the United States Constitution itself. That has tremendous, uh, uh, tr tremendous implications, some of which has, are still being worked out. The, the, there is a, cent uh, a central uh, point of the 14th Amendment is that the Bill of, uh, the Bill of Rights should be extended to, uh, to the states so that all the states have to, uh, have to have the Bill of Rights requirements. That has only really happened in the, in the case of the First Amendment. The Second Amendment, uh, for instance, which uh, Donald talked about, uh, it, it, that is in many ways still left up to the, uh, to, to the states, although some court decisions are, are, are finally starting to, to, to turn that back. So you have, to, you have to think very carefully about what amendments uh, to the Constitution could do. They can have very, very far-reaching effects. A third point which has already been mentioned is that a written constitution does hand enormous power to the judicial branch. Now, in, in the US, this was, uh, this, was, uh, the, the, this was compounded by a sort of seizure of power by the judicial branch uh, in the case Marbury versus Madison, which, uh, gave the, in which the Supreme Court asserted its right to strike down laws as unconstitutional. But uh, a, a, a probably more relevant example recently is the famous Roe versus Wade case, uh, which uh, uh, legalized abortion through, throughout the United States. The, uh, the, the, the judges in that case found what they called uh, a, a, found a right to privacy in the uh, in the Constitution, which isn't written down anywhere in the Constitution. There is no such. No, nowhere does the Constitution talk about, uh, about privacy. But they said they found this in the penumbra of the Constitution. So the judges in Roe versus Wade essentially made up law uh, despite the, the benefit of, of, of a written Constitution. And sometimes they can, uh, they can actually interpret uh, laws, either, sorry, interpret constitutional clauses in a way which seems directly opposed to the literal reading of the Constitution. For instance, uh, there's been a, a recent court case in the United States about the president's ability to appoint uh, officers of the United States, uh, cabinet secretaries, ambassadors and the like, during uh, a Senate recess. Uh, the, the, the court found that he did, did have the power, but in this particular case the president abused it. However, if, if you read the... Um, read the actual written text of, of, of that clause, it talks about, uh, it, it, it talks about uh, vacancies that should arise during the recess. And the president in no case uh, uh, appointed somebody uh, when the vacancy arose during a recess. The, the vacancies had all arisen during the actual terms of the, uh, of, 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 of the Senate, and the Senate should have been able to deal with that through the normal process. But the, the president uh, abused this power, and many, many presidents have before, and the courts have agreed with it, despite the literal meaning of, of, of the clause. Sometimes they just ignore things. Uh, there is a compact clause of the, United, of, the, of the Constitution, which basically says that, the, uh, that states can't make uh, agreements uh, between states uh, as to how they're going to, to, to handle things, or with 
foreign powers or foreign provinces without the agreement of the Congress. Uh, most of the, uh, of, of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, provisions I I in the United States have been through regional compacts. The New England Regional uh, Greenhouse Gas Initiative, for instance. These are all compacts from the states that, uh, that should have required congressional approval. And in all probability, they wouldn't have got that, uh, that congressional approval. Yet when we go to the courts and say, you know, look, the, clause, the written constitution says you have to get, you have to get uh, the permission from Congress to do this, the courts just turn around and say, no, we're not going to take the case. So, 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 so that's, uh, can, can, that can be a, an extremely big problem. When the judiciary has so much power to interpret it as, as it wishes, it, it, it becomes a power. Now, why do I say that I, I fear that the United Kingdom is, is sleepwalking into the constitution, uh, a, a written constitution? It's because the, the, from the Scottish referendum. Um, I think that's changed everything. It, it, the, the West Lothian question is only the beginning of the constitutional issues that, that the United Kingdom is going to get, get into. Uh, an English parliament if such a body is, is reduced, has to have its powers defined somewhere. Similarly, the Westminster Parliament. Otherwise, you are going to get into significant uh, separation of powers issues. In this case, a problem of separation of powers between the executive and the legislature. Uh, if you have the executive controlling parliament, the, uh, a, West, uh, a Westminster agenda, uh, sorry, a Westminster uh, executive controlling the, the legislative agenda of the English Parliament, then the English Parliament essentially means nothing. But if you have uh, an English Parliament passing laws by itself, with uh, the, the, the executive, which the executive disagrees with, then you have essentially the end of the Westminster system. So I think uh, the United Kingdom, as a result of the Scottish referendum, is, is backing into separation of powers. And I fear that if, uh, if the next election goes, uh, goes the wrong way, then you will have, face exactly the situation that Donald described. You will have a constitutional convention uh, staffed by people with their, with their own agendas. You can just imagine the environmental clauses that are going to be stuck into the, uh, into the Constitution, the, 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 the labour clauses that are going to be stuck into the Constitution. And the constitutional convention will do what, it's like, what it likes. First principle of the uh, American Constitutional Convention was that it was founded, it was set up in order to suggest amendments to the Articles of Confederation. It didn't. It wrote a whole new constitution. Constitutional Con uh, Convention is a huge hostage to fortune, and I wish you the very best of luck with that. Well, Ian, thank you very much. And now I look to you and the audience for your contributions and thoughts on the question of whether we should have a written constitution. Gentlemen, uh, there with his hand up first. You, we may or may not have a microphone. It's coming to you now. Just hang on for one minute, sir. It's coming to you now. Please uh, let us know who you are. Keep your questions brief. I won't call on all four panellists for each question. Uh, we'll try and fill in as many people as we can. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. My name is uh, Chris, Chris Wintle, right, I'm a local activist, right, and I look at what I call constitutional issues, right. Uh, I'd just like to point out, as an, uh, as an observant, right, or something like that, uh, there is actually a website, which I find out what's name, which my friend and that I would work, which is actually called the English Constitution Group dot org, English Constitution Group Bean one word, right? And uh, basically, I've got a friend called Albert Burgess, who has actually written a layman's guide to the English Constitution. I don't know if maybe you might want to sort of like explore the website, get on the mailing list or something like that, or maybe sort of like bounce some thoughts and ideas around each other, you know, and see, see if we can come up with some solutions. That's all it is. Just basically an observation, that's all. Thank you very much. An observation, not a question. Behind you, there's another. Yep, Christopher Gill. Christopher Gill. President of the Freedom Association, I wonder to what extent the panel would agree with me if I suggested that rather than focusing on a new constitution or a new bill of rights, we really should be concentrating on the way in which the present constitution is being abused. Now, in saying that, I'm particularly conscious of the way in which the European Arrest Warrant, for example, <coughs> trashes basic fundamental tenets of Magna Carta. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've written quite a lot about your <laughs> well, I don't think it's only fair to ask you to go first. Quite right. I couldn't agree more. And the, um, 
you know, there's lots of legality issues around the European arrest warrant, but if you really wanted, uh, tragically, if you really wanted a case that was the clarion call for everything that's wrong about it, it was the Asia King case. And I wonder whether that may be the tipping point where people actually start to understand why this power um, is so prone and so susceptible to abuse. And I should say, I think, you know, Hampshire police are not an evil bunch of sort of, you know, uh, 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 individuals. But imagine if, if sort of well-meaning Hampshire police can abuse a power so badly. Think what the Hungarian, Bulgarian, Romanian, or, or frankly Italian authorities would do. I've got cases in my constituency. I've led the campaign in Parliament for um, both extradition reform on the US and the EU side. And, uh, you know, we've got a chance to deal with it. We are still go got to decide whether we've opt in to a range of EU crime and policing measures. And I can tell you, um, I, I don't see the case for opting into any of them. And that's not because I'm so hostile or neuralgic about cooperation with our European partners. I like really close operational cooperation, but not at the price of liberty or democracy. And uh, there is no binary trade-off. So your point's very well made. Martin Hill. Can I say I fully agree with Dominic on the madness of opting in to the, back into the European arrest warrant. Um, the, the problem is that if we opt into it, it will become uh, fully part of, of European binding European Union law uh, and will then, uh, unless and until we repeal the 1972 Act, prevail over all forms of domestic law. Um, and this isn't just a theoretical argument. Now, we, we had heard mention of the two. You know, we now have two European courts uh, involved in, in human rights issues, both the Strasbourg Court under the Convention and the Luxembourg Court, the Court of Justice of the European <coughs> Union. What is extremely interesting uh, is the different attitude of these courts when it comes to rights which impact on or might interfere with the on-rolling juggernaut of European integration. And there's a very specific case of enormous interest called Moroni, um, where uh, the European arrest warrant was executed in Spain uh, against an individual who claimed his constitutional right under the Spanish Constitution not to be carted off under a European arrest warrant to be shoved in jail after a trial had been conducted in absentia. And the Luxembourg court said, oh, well, that's neither here nor there. Um, that there's no such right uh, to resist being rendered up under the European arrest warrant decision. And what's more, uh, you, the Spanish Constitutional Court, you can get lost. Um, you're not allowed to... Uh, uh, confer this constitutional right on this individual. He must be uh, uh, Trump. He must be given up under the warrant. So I would say one of the things we should uh, seriously think about doing is if we have on our own, our own domestic bill of rights, it should be made to prevail over anything in European Union law, which would then force the issue of leaving the EU, wouldn't it? Well, it would create a <laughs> I, I saw that. It, 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 <laughs> It does seem to me that the Conservative Party's position is to opt back into the European arrest warrant and a collection of other powers and then start negotiation about coming out of the series of powers. It's a difficult policy to justify. <laughs> uh, gentleman with the pink pen. Thank you. Tony Woodcock, uh, Councillor from Poole. Um, what worries me about all of this, and it's been mentioned by the panel, is the, uh, the, the case that the United Kingdom is becoming more and more disunited and fragmenting, with a, with a danger of balkanising uh, almost completely if we don't do something about it. And clearly, obviously, the Scottish referendum um, and the result of that with the Devo Max and so on has made it worse. Um, what um, the, the possible solution that some people have said, and I'm not really keen, particularly keen on it myself, is a federal or federated United Kingdom. So what does the panel, first of all, think of that, uh, that possibility, and would that um, entail having a written constitution? Because uh, I agree with a lot of the speakers who said a written constitution is something we perhaps ought to avoid because of the drawbacks that you have mentioned. So those two things. Well, Ian, you live in a country with a federal system, so let's ask you. Yes, in, in fact, the, the, the federal system is the norm in the Anglosphere. It's a federal, there's a federal system in Australia, there's a federal system in Canada, 
uh, generally, generally speaking, once you get a, a, above a certain size, uh, the Anglosphere has, has decided that federal systems are, are, are best, the, the big exception being the United Kingdom. Um, I, I think the trouble is that the, the genie is out of the bottle now. The Westminster system has been broken. Uh, as soon as you go to, uh, to, uh, to, to devolution, just simple devolution to begin with, you have uh, a, a, a breakdown, a breakdown of, of the Westminster system. And once you go to Devo Max, then as, as, uh, I can't see any way, any way back from that. Uh, my, my preferred s s solution to the um, uh, to the English question would not actually be to have a separate English Parliament, which would be over mighty in in the United Kingdom itself, but actually to devolve the same sort of powers to the English counties. Uh, when you look at the United States and the population of a state like, say, Wyoming, for example, there isn't a single county, well, actually, sorry, Rutland, there is what, what, the only county uh, in the United Kingdom with a smaller population than Wyoming is, uh, is Rutland. So you can, it, 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 and Wyoming is a fully functioning state and has been for over 100 years. So it, it, it is plausible to think of uh, devolving powers to, to the counties and retaining in Westminster uh, powers over such things like you know, highways and transportation policy, which probably would, be, um, uh, would, would not be ideally handled uh, by devolution to, to, to the councils. But I, th but I think you know, the, the, the county uh, has, to be, uh, has to be considered as uh, an alternative to the English Parliament, and I think it would be preferable. Stone? Um, <laughs> the, the West Lothian question is, I think, text far more intelligent people than me for um, the best part of 30, 40 years. The, the best solution that I've, I've come up with is that if you have a unicameral Scottish Parliament and a unicameral Welsh Assembly and possibly will have a unicameral um, English Parliament, would be to have the House of Lords as an upper chamber um, for all of them, and it would bring together... Um, Scotland and Wales back into the fold and at least come, keep some semblance that the House of Lords would be, uh, as, perhaps as a Senate, um, reuniting the United Kingdom. That might be a, a, a possible solution. Um, I've got Chris Gill's votes. So that's a very good start for that one. Um, devolving, devolving power further within England, I think, would have to happen. An, an English Parliament would be over mighty within any, any federalised um, United Kingdom. And then you are stuck with going, is it to the counties, which is certainly what I would prefer. And uh, I know we're, we're not allowed to mention our, our still good friend Douglas Carr as well, but Douglas was pushing for uh, devolution to the counties in terms of sales tax raising powers for each of them, and I think that would be a very sensible solution. My fear is that the vested interests pushed by the European Union and by the Labour Party would want devolution to regions, and those regions would be a shock horror identical to the regions that the European Parliament has um, for which our MEPs sit. And that, of course, is Brussels' goal, is to balkanise the whole of the European Union through each of the 28 uh, member states so that each of them is broken up into the little units that mean that that is where your loyalty goes to, no longer to the nation state, and your superior loyalty goes um, to Brussels, and that's who they want us to bow down to. So that, that is the danger in allowing regionalisation, but I think my general fear remains that uh, once we start going down this road, I really do fear that we are not prepared for this fight. So let's be very careful before we push too far on this. Well, did you want to... Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think the genie is out of the bottle. I think change will have to happen. Uh, I, I think I actually draw the opposite conclusion as to what, what change should happen, because... Um, what we do not want to see, I mean, the problem that we face now uh, is that Scotland has a, lot, a huge amount of devolved powers and indeed will get more, and it actually will have virtually all the powers that any state in the United States has, possibly more. Um, and then you have England being totally controlled by the federal, quote, legislature. Uh, and the solutions, some of the solutions are being, that are being put forward is let's... Uh, address this problem of, of England being disadvantaged by dismembering England uh, into either regional units or county councils or whatever. Uh, and, and I think that is not, not the solution to the problem, it's making the problem worse. 
Um, England is a unit. Uh, it has been a unit for over a thousand years. Um, and, you know, by and large, we expect the same laws uh, in all parts of England. Um, we, 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 our history is not, oh, we'd rather have different laws in uh, Cornwall from the laws that apply in Essex. Uh, there's no, uh, or a totally separate court system, whatever, there's no appetite for that. So the solution has to be, in my view, um, to confer on the members of parliament sitting for England equivalent powers in English matters to those which uh, the Scottish parliament has, uh, and to confer on the members of parliament sitting for England and Wales equivalent powers on matters of law uh, where England and Wales are still a unit. Uh, this is complicated, uh, but it's doable. Uh, it does lead to the, uh, uh, the end result um, that certain departments of the central government could, depending on which way elections go, end up facing a parliament that controls policy, the law in their area, and indeed, in my view, ought also to control the supply of money in their area, uh, uh, which might be of opposite party political control from their own party. This may indeed entail, in due course, thought to be given for severing um, the government, uh, present government of the United Kingdom uh, into ministers who are United Kingdom ministers and to ministers who are English ministers. Uh, and if that happens, I do not regard that as a disaster, but as a desirable outcome. Thank you very much. Please. Hi, um, Marjorie Bayliss, now residing in Devon. I have a big fear of power being devolved to the counties. Most of our county councillors are, sorry, not especially high calibre. Um, a lot of our MPs are, to be perfectly honest. I don't want more government. Um, it's expensive. Let's keep it residing with English MPs if that's the route we want to go down to. But the point that I wanted to make was going back to the Constitution. I, I, I've listened to all the arguments. I think they, they all have power. Um, the left are very concerned that if we leave the uh, ECHR that we will uh, become pariahs within Europe. You know, I mean, how can you be a pariah if you're a member of something that Russia's a member of, for Christ's sake? So we need, we need to do that. Um, I'm, I'm, I can't understand why we want to be point, you know, going back into the um, European arrest warrant. And, uh, and I despair at the supine nature of our politicians on the right and the lawyers, if you like, in not being vociferous. We are walking into a referendum where we haven't got the funding, we've, we've got the arguments, but we've not got the funding, we've not got enough people to go out and make the case. Somebody needs to be pulling this together in a, in a much more directed way. And I'm just sort of very, very worried about what's, what's going to happen. Thank you. It sounds like a case for the Federal Society. I'm going to come to you, Dominic, on the human rights question, as you've written a lot about that. But mm -hmm. first of all, Ian, the County Council um, idea of devolving power to counties was, was your fault, so justify the mediocrity of County Councils. Defend yourself. <laughs> well, I think you know, it, it, that, that's a problem with the political class in general these days. Uh, the, the, uh, I think the p part, of the, part of the problem is that, uh, the, 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 that uh, we're talking about devolving powers. There's far too much power in central government as it is. Mm. And so what, in many ways what we need to do before we, 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 we devolve power is have a, have a discussion about what powers government should have and then alloc try to allocate them uh, at, 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 the more at the most appropriate level. So, again, I, I, I would look to uh, other uh, Anglosphere uh, dominions and, and, uh, and learn lessons from them as to how uh, the, the thing, things have worked when you have power at different levels. Uh, I live in a county in Virginia that essentially has uh, more powers than, uh, than, any, uh, than any local council in, uh, in the United Kingdom. It, it doesn't, do, uh, doesn't do badly with them at all. Other, other counties are basket cases. I mean, the, the, the 
this is a part of the problem of the, of the political process. You will always get some bad, uh, some bad apples. But once you, once you go from county uh, in the United States, you then go to the state level, and the states have uh, certain powers, and then you get to the federal level. And the federal level, you know, when you look at the United States Constitution, the federal government actually doesn't have that much power at all, theoretically. But it has accrued lots of power, which it is essentially drawn up from the counties and the states to itself. So what, what we need to do is, is, is think about pushing the power back down to the, the, the most local level feasible. And I think in England that has to be the councils. Thank you. And finally, Dominic Rohn. Um, on the pariah status of the United Kingdom because we don't give votes to prisoners, I think Putin would just laugh at us if we did. Um, and the reality is the Hearst case was 2005, mm -hmm. nine years ago. Are we pariah status now? No, and just this week, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, which review all the unimplemented judgments, considered this again. <clears throat> Did they fine us? Did they enforce compensation awards? Did they threaten to suspend our voting rights? No, they just punted it into 2015 to consider again at some point in the future. So I, I don't think there's any serious argument. Uh, but can I be very clear? I would like to pull out of the ECHR. I'm just putting forward the argument that the left would put forward and how we have to counter it. I, I wasn't very sure. clear about that. Sorry. But, I mean, I think actually there's, we may end up having to withdraw, but I think actually with the Bill of Rights and the way I described replacing the Human Rights Act, defending our Parliament's right to say no when we get some of these arbitrary judgments, actually that's something we should consider first. Um, and the point is that the President of the Supreme Court, no less, the former Lord Chief Justice Eagle Judge, has said we can push back, we can ultimately say no. And so when I get that argument, and I debate it with Shami Chakrabarty and the like all the time, I say, look, I understand this is a constitutional clash. I'm not saying there's not a difficulty here, but when push comes to shove, when I, as an elected MP accountable to the voters, have got to choose between diplomatic niceties abroad or defending democratic prerogatives at home, it's a no-brainer. Winning it every time, and I feel I can defend it on principle and I can defend it on the doorstep. Thank you very much. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank you very much for your participation today. What I think has been a very interesting discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank the Federalist Society and the Freedom Association for hosting us and sponsoring uh, this excellent discussion. And most of all, I'd invite you please to join with me in thanking the panel in the usual way.